Okay, it's time to revisit rearrangements along with a new functional group called isocyanates. Now we've had some rearrangements in the past. The ones that we've had in Chem 343 were the Beckman. which inserts a nitrogen between, right, inserts a nitrogen next to a carbonyl. And we've also had the bayer vilger which also, which inserts an oxygen next to a carbonyl. Now these reactions are rearrangements, but they are for ketones and aldehydes only, and do not work for carboxylic acid derivatives. So, top one is the Beckman, the bottom one is the Bayer Vilger. For rearrangements using carboxylic acid chemistry, carboxylic acid derivatives, we are going to use the courteous or Hoffman rearrangements. So let's first start with the Hoffman. The Hoffman rearrangement. Starts out with a primary amide and you really do need the NH2 at the end of it. Add sodium hydroxide, bromine, and water to it, and you get the amine. Now, at first glance, this looks like a reduction, but this is actually an oxidation. First glance, it looks like the reaction of lithium aluminum hydride. with an amide. Because lithium aluminum hydride with an amide gives an amine. But if we look closely at it, numbers, number the carbons, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. We are actually missing a carbon. More accurately, carbon four, which is the carbonyl carbon, is lost. as carbon dioxide. That's why this is actually an oxidation. The carbon started with three bonds, 
to an electronegative element. Now it has four bonds, making this an oxidation. So these look very similar to each other, lithium aluminum hydride and the Hoffman rearrangement. So you really need to pay attention to the number of carbons here. It's crucial that you do so. So the mechanism. Starts out with acid-base chemistry. The base comes, takes this proton off. Now what I'm going to sh show is the electrons from the NH bond swing here between the carbon and the nitrogen and electrons going up. This first step, all it is, is an acid-base reaction. Keep in mind, all I'm showing you is a different resonance structure of this anion right here. The major resonance structure is this with the electrons on the O, and so I'm just going to show the major resonance structure of these anions, and it's a good idea you get used to drawing deprotonations that can give this structure right here. That's going to help you out when we start talking about reactions on Friday involving a species called an enolate. So what happens next is the electrons swing down, kick these electrons over, and kick out the bromide. If you want to think about on the minor resonance structure what's happening is the electrons from the nitrogen going here and doing an SN2 on the bromine creating a new nitrogen bromine bond. Like so. The base then comes and takes the proton off, deprotonates again, and then you get this. Okay, now this is a lot like the Beckman rearrangement. We have a double bond in attached to a good leaving group. Same way here. We have a double bond in attached to a leaving group. What we are going to use is we're going to use the electrons in the O minus. We're going to swing those down. And what that's going to do is shift this carbon group, this entire group, over to the nitrogen and kick the bromine off. And this is an irreversible reaction. Now, I'm going to number the carbons. And that's what we get. This species right here is what is known as an isocyanate. And isocyanates are incredibly useful, useful molecules. They're used in a lot of things. They are also incredibly dangerous. And we'll get to that um, towards the end of the lecture. They are very reactive compounds, and they have a tendency to react quite viciously with water and amines. In this case, we still have 
hydroxide present. Hydroxide can add to that. Electrons go up. Oops, added a carbon. Like so. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna protonate the nitrogen. We're gonna have the electrons O minus wings down, kick those electrons to here and onto there. And that gives this material here. Now, this pattern here, whoa. Know this pattern. You're gonna see this a lot. The pattern I'm talking about is this, an O minus connected to carbon, connected to a double bond. You're going to see that O minus swing its electrons down, kick those electrons over to grab onto something, like a proton. You're gonna see it on a nitrogen as well. You are going to see this a lot. So, my advice to you, get used to it. It protonates not on the oxygen because these have a tendency to be unstable. It protonates on the other atom. So please, please remember this. Know this pattern. The O minus swings its electrons down to the sp2 carbon. That kicks the double bond electrons over to grab an H or another electrophile, which we will be talking about a lot come on Friday. And the following week and pretty much the rest of the semester, we'll be talking about this motif a lot. Okay, so back to this. This molecule here is what's called a carbamic acid. Carbamic acids are unstable compounds. They rapidly become carbonyls and it means they lose carbon dioxide. They are unstable. The mechanism of this this is what's called decarboxylation. I'll show you a couple different, actually I'll just show you one mechanism of this. Okay, know that Carbamic acids are unstable compounds. What happens is you have some acid that comes and protonates. 
Now it can be another carbamic acid. Or it can be simply water. Or H3O plus. But regardless what happens, you protonate the amine. It is the least likely spot on the molecule probably to protonate, but that's the one you protonate. And then you take the other proton off. We have OMA swing its electrons down and kick the amine off. And you get your amine and carbon dioxide. Okay? If you want, you can show these in a slightly different order. You can show the deprotonation first. And then protonation of the amine. Again, it's the least likely one to be protonated, but that's the one that's protonated. The OMS swings its electron sound and kicks off the amine. Okay. So you can do it this mechanism as well. Please, for the love of Dr. Pepper, do not show this mechanism. The problem with this mechanism is this first step. You would have to form a one, two, three, four, four center transition state. That is highly strained, highly unfavorable. So please don't show that. Now, this is not the first time we've actually come across these carbamic acids. Remember the Bach protecting group? Now 
Remember the Z protecting group? Remember the F mock protecting group? All of the cleavage conditions for these. What they do is they break this bond right here. They are each creating the carbamic acid. And these carbamic acids are all stable, sorry, are all unstable. So add this motif to your molecules that are unstable and you should not draw as synthetic intermediates. These are mechanistic intermediates. And they become amines and carbon dioxide. So that was sort of a side note there. There it is. Where were we? Ah, Hoffman. The Hoffman rearrangement. it goes through an isocyanate. But due to the isocyanate's reactivity, it cannot be isolated. What it can be, though, is it can be trapped. So you can actually run a Hoffman reaction in a solvent other than water. And this works best if R is either a methyl group or primary alcohol, or primary carbon. So like ethanol or propanol or something like that. And what you can actually do is you can trap the isocyanate as a carbamate ester. Carbamate esters has another name for that functional group. It's called urethane. You might have heard of the term urethane, um, especially when it comes to paint or foam. But essentially, this is the urethane linkage, a nitrogen attached to a carbonyl, attached to an OR group. The mechanism of this is pretty much the same mechanism. And I wrote ME here, that really should technically be an R group. Whatever 
and it matches this R right here. So say we had methoxide, OME minus. And we basically do the Hoffman mechanism. And then you do the Hoffman rearrangement. And then methoxide adds to that. And then you swing the electrons down, kick the pi bond over to grab an H from the solvent. And you get a carbamate ester. which unlike carbamic acids are stable and can be isolated. But again, we're going to an isocyanate intermediate, but you cannot isolate, you cannot stop at the isocyanate in the Hoffman. So that brings us to another rearrangement. And it's called the courteous rearrangement. And it is one of my favorite mechanisms. It is just awesome. But it requires a little bit of setup. The setup involves a synthesis of what's called an acyl azid. And there's a few ways of making acyl azids. What we are going to be using is making them from reacting an acid chloride with sodium azid. And this mechanism you can think of as just an SN2 mechanism. The actual courteous mechanism is what you do with the acyl azid. Acyl azid do not isolate. Never isolate an acyl azid. Acyl azids are explosive and they are shock sensitive and if you look at them wrong, they go boom. So please be awfully careful with acyl azids. Don't try to even think about isolating these things. If you do, they will go boom. So with that said, what the courteous rearrangement does is it takes this acyl azid that you made 
and you heat it up. That's exactly what you want to do with an explosive compound is heat it up. Yeah. By the way, don't heat up explosive compounds. That's a bad idea. Do it safely. And this reaction should only be done when you have a lot of experience underneath your belt. So anyways, acyl is it, and you do it in some sort of unreactive solvent, like say benzene. And you get the isocyanate. And if you do it in an unreactive solvent like benzene, it's possible to actually isolate the isocyanate. Now, what I like about this is the mechanism. The mechanism is a one-step mechanism. It goes from the azolazid right to the isocyanate. No intermediates. Essentially, its reaction energy profile is this. Heat it up, it does the rearrangement, and then you're right to your products. One step. Go ahead and try to draw the drawings. The byproduct of this with the acylazid, sorry, with the isocyanate, is nitrogen gas. Try the mechanism. Okay. Let me draw the mechanism. If you weren't able to see it, don't worry. It's not an easy mechanism to see from this resonance structure. Instead, you draw a minor resonance structure. Send these electrons down here, these electrons go here, these electrons go up. you get this structure right here. Now you should be able to draw the mechanism. This structure looks an awful lot like the intermediate in the Hoffman. These electrons swing down kick the R group over to this nitrogen, and that kicks off the leaving group. The leaving group is nitrogen gas. You don't get a much better leaving group than nitrogen gas. And you get the isocyanate, which if you do this in an inert solvent like benzene or toluene, you can isolate that. Now, isocyanates. They are incredibly reactive compounds.
They react wa with water. to temporarily form carbamic acids, which then become amines and carbon dioxide. They react with alcohol to form carbamates, or carbamate esters, or what they're called. Another name for these are called urethanes. They also react with amines. By amines, they can be ammonia, primary amines, or secondary amines, any of these three. form ureas. Okay. So, the reactions. The mechanism of these reactions. Let's do the mechanism of this with an alcohol. Think of an isocyanate as slightly basic. So you do an acid-base reaction. And then the O minus adds, electrons go up to the nitrogen. And you have a carbamate ester. If this is a water, well, all you do is replace the ethyl group with a hydrogen. and then it does the decarboxylation. And that mechanism we talked about earlier on. Amines though, are not as acidic as water and alcohol are. Amines are slightly basic. So instead, you have the amine attack. Now it doesn't matter if the electrons go up to the O or go up to the N. mainly because you just get a different resonance structure. And then other amine deprotonates. And we're not going to worry about the reversibility of arrows on this. I'm not 100% consistent. So I don't expect you to be.
So do not worry about the reversibility of arrows in isocyanate reactions. So, where isocyanates are useful tools. They're used in a lot of things. This isocyanate for example, is a chief ingredient in Gorilla Glue. And this, essentially, the directions say, moisten the two objects you want to um, stick together, then add your Gorilla Glue to them, and then press them together. What the moistening does is add a small amount of water. Just a tiny bit of water to this. And what that does is it converts a small amount of these into amines. Well, the amine portion then reacts with another isocyanate And this mean reacts with another isocyanate and keeps going on and on and on. Until it meet, reaches an amine or an oxygen. Are the two surfaces that you want to glue together. And essentially what you're doing is between your two surfaces so the surface has some sort of nucleophilic residue, either an OH or a nitrogen, and you're creating polymer linkages, several of them linking together, creating this hard surface, lots of covalent bonds, and then these also create hydrogen bonds in between strands, further strengthening it, making it very difficult to break again. So it was chiefly used in I'm gluing two pieces of wood together. Well, wood is cellulose. Cellulose involves, is basically just polymerized glucose. And we have lots of OHs on glucose to use to glue the two surfaces together. Okay, that's in Gorilla Glue. And so cyanates are also used, like carbaryl is one of the most widely used insecticides in the world. And it looks like this. And you can imagine, try to predict the, the two molecules, the isocyanate and the alcohol used to make this carbamate. Well, what you do to predict the products is, here's your alcohol, here's your isocyanate.
alcohol. Isocyanate. This is the widely one most widely used insecticides in the world. It was discovered in 1958-ish, and the company that used it was Union Carbide. They discovered it. Okay. Now we cannot go further in this lecture without talking about how dangerous isocyanates are, especially this one right here. This is called methyl isocyanate. And I'm not going to go into any of the details of this because I just don't have sufficient enough gravitas to really do this justice. So you're not going to be tested on this, but if you're curious on how dangerous methyl isocyanate is, do a quick internet search on the Bhopal disaster. It is widely considered to be the worst industrial accident in human history. It was in the 80s, and it is a nightmare. So, to further give you an idea of how dangerous methyl isocyanate is from that, companies that use methyl isocyanate don't store it in um, very large tanks anymore. They rather make it as they need it, and the way they make it is they react this molecule with methylamine very carefully to make methyl isocyanate. And to give you an idea of how dangerous methyl isocyanate is, this compound, which they make and store in large quantities, is phosgene. And it is a weapon of mass destruction. It was one of the chemical warfare agents of World War I. It's a nightmare, but they would much rather store a large quantity of phosgene than they would a large quantity of methyl isocyanate due to this disaster right here. So. Anyways, a little bit of the history of this. The mechanism of this is going to be on the problem set, and yeah, that's all the time we have today.